Well, good morning, everyone. How you doing today? Welcome to Woodlands. All right, all right. Some of you, it's your first time back for a while. It's really good to see you here today. Appreciate you coming on out. It's a big day here at Woodlands. Uh, it's a day of our annual vision meeting. We got a lot of great things to share after the service today. And we got some really great things to share in the service today. Uh, because the Word of God is always the best thing ever. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, God's Word. Uh, we want to welcome all those of you who are here uh, in the house, as well as those of you watching online. So good to have you with us as well. Uh, glad you could tune in. Hey, I want to ask something of those of you there at home, if you would, watching on Facebook, if you wouldn't mind just going over and clicking the share button, and that way you can share the, this great message, the good news of Jesus, on your Facebook page so that your friends will be able to hear what God has to say to them today, and you'll be able to even maybe even talk about what this message had, had to say to you. Now, we uh, take a moment right now before the message begins to have a moment for generosity. And uh, you'll see up here on the screen, there's three ways uh, that you can donate to Woodlands. And uh, those are, are different options that are available. And I just want to share a little bit with you about when you give to Woodlands, what, what, what does that do? Well, last week we had a, a, a car peace rally. It was a car peace rally. And there was a bunch of people that showed up here at Woodlands last Sunday afternoon and we had signs on our cars and we had messages written on our windows and we drove all throughout uh, uh, Homewood and we were honking our horns and we were waving at people and you know getting the message out uh, of, uh, of, of God's love and grace of justice and equality and that we want to see it peacefully, and that we want to be a, an instrument of peace. And I tell you, it was, a, it was a really a tremendous experience, tremendous experience. Uh, and and um, uh, we'd have, you know, a, a hiccup or two along the way, but even in that, we saw God honored. Uh, we, saw, we saw God uh, praised through that. So, you know, Woodlands is involved in our community. We want to be a church for the community. You know, that's, that's really who we are and who we want to be, is a church for the community. Now, um, this Wednesday night, I want to invite you all, we're going to begin Wednesday night prayer. Wednesday night prayer at 7 o'clock on Zoom. All right, so you can get the link on our website. It'll also be available to you on our social media. You'll be able to find it at Facebook and Instagram. And so on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, if you want to tune in for an hour of prayer, um, we're going to have a, start off with a little worship. Garrett's going to lead us in a little worship. Uh, Suresh, uh, uh, one of our great guys here at Woodlands, who he and his good buddy James have been doing prayer every night for five months, guys. Five months. They've been doing prayer every night at 7 o'clock. And I've been able to join them several times, and it's amazing. But we're going to make Wednesday night the night that we're going to ask everybody to come together, get on Zoom, and pray. And we'll see, you know, once things lighten up a little bit, and we're able to get together a little more often, you know, maybe that'll just continue on with a, a prayer service here uh, at Woodlands. But for now, it's on Zoom. So um, when you give to Woodlands, you're giving to people. You're giving to spiritual life and spiritual development. You're giving uh, to the, the, the heart change of people who have been beaten and broken and hurt by the world. And so that's really what we're all about here at Woodlands. Well, as I uh, transition to the message, I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Mark Driscoll. Uh, he's a, a pastor out in Arizona, brilliant, brilliant guy. He's written a number of books. And his book, Who Do You Think You Are?, has uh, really kind of been the impetus for this message. And he has a message series by the same name. And it's just provided a lot of really incredible in, uh, input or uh, material, I guess you might say, uh, knowledge that I've been able to uh, read and put together and pass on to you. So big props to Pastor Mark. So the big idea of our study, and this is a study on identity, uh, knowing who you are. And the big idea is simply this. When you know who you are, you know what to do. When you know who you are, you know what to do. And uh, a favorite, uh, 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 some pers a person who really battled identity uh, comes from a favorite book of mine in the Bible. It's the book of Ruth. 
Now, so those of you who know me, you might be thinking, well, that's obvious. You're married to a Ruth, right? Well, it's not just because I'm married to a Ruth. The book of Ruth is an amazing short story. If you've never read it, I would want to invite you to go this afternoon, look it up. It's in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant of Scripture, and read that all in one setting. It's very short. You can knock it out probably in, in you know, 15 minutes, 20, if you're a little slower reader. Uh, you know, and uh, so anyway, in that book of Ruth, we are introduced to Naomi. Now, um, Naomi is married, and there's a famine that hits Israel. So food has become scarce, right? It's an agrarian society. If you can't grow your food, you don't eat, okay? Um, in this economic crisis, her husband decides to take Naomi and her two boys and go to another country. And the other country they go to is actually a pagan country. By that, I mean they do not worship God in that country. And so shortly after they arrive in this other country, their two boys get married. But they get married to local women, not Jewish women, which was a big deal to Jewish people in that society. Uh, shortly after those boys are married, their father dies after moving them away from everything that they knew. But then it becomes more tragic. Shortly after that, both of the boys die. And now here's Naomi. Naomi is in a foreign land where she is all alone, where she is broken, where she is lost, and quite frankly, she's bitter. As a matter of fact, her identity was that as a daughter of God, and her life was supposed to be sweet because that's what the name Naomi means. The name Naomi means sweet. But we read about her in Ruth 120 where she says this, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, because my life has become bitter. The name Mara means bitter. It means bitter. So let me ask you, are you Mara? Are you Mara? Are you struggling with bitterness? Have you been bitter? We titled today's message, I Am Forgiven. And this entire message series, every message starts with I am, and then we talk about a characteristic of our identity in Christ. I am forgiven. So to jump in, we're going to look at five ways that people become bitter. Five ways that people become bitter. The first four, now listen to this, the first four are illegitimate ways that people become bitter, okay? People become bitter, but they're illegitimate. That's the first four. The fifth one is actually a legitimate way. Number one, the first illegitimate way that people become bitter, and listen for yourself in this, because I think we'll all find ourselves in one of these descriptions, or maybe more. You wrongly think that someone has sinned against you. You wrongly think that someone has sinned against you, okay? I'll give you a case study, all right? There, was, uh, there were two brothers, and they had a business. And uh, uh, the, uh, in, in, in that business, um, uh, the time came when they had a split, a rift between them, and the brothers did not speak for a number of years, right? I mean, they, uh, the one brother accused the other brother of stealing from him, of stealing from him. And um, this just split the family right down the middle. They lived in the same town. They both had children. So over time, they, they quit gathering together for holidays. Years went by with both their children. Their children did not get to grow up with their cousins. Okay, so they did not get that joy of knowing their cousins. And, and there was just this, this division and this deep bitterness that, that developed between them. Finally... Um, there was actually a third-party peacemaker that came in to work through the bitterness that they had. And what they found out, by digging down to the bottom of the conflict, um, they, they asked, and the one brother said, He stole from me. I will not forgive him. I will never forgive him. The other brother shot back, I did not steal from you. I didn't do that. And so as they dug deeper, they explored, they investigated, they came to find out that there was thievery that had happened in their business. But it was not the brother. It was another employee who had stolen from them in their business. You see, that first brother believed a lie of his own making. Sometimes we think we've been sinned against folks, 
But we haven't. It's just something that we've assumed, something that we've believed. And we've believed it for so long, it has become our truth, our reality. And we've never, ever really checked it out to find out if it's actually true. So we've got to be careful to investigate the facts. Now, the second illegitimate way people become bitter is through unreasonable or unspoken expectations. You have unreasonable or unspoken expectations. Unreasonable meaning that you are expecting somebody to say something or to be something for you, and they disappointed you. They didn't measure up. They didn't deliver on what you were expecting from them. And so you're hurt and you're grieved and you're angry about it. But the fact is your expectation was unreasonable. Your expectation was unspoken. So it was really unfair to put that on the other person. I, I know this has happened uh, in marriages or in dating relationships. I remember hearing a, a, a woman, she was a celebrity, um, who was being interviewed on the radio. And the interviewer was asking her about, she was upset about something with her boyfriend or her husband. And, and, and the, the interviewer actually said, well, how was he supposed to know that? And she literally said, he's just supposed to know. He's just supposed to know. And, and, and there's a lot of broken relationships where people have these assumptions. Well, if you knew me, if you loved me, if you paid attention, you would just know, right? Folks, that's totally wrong. We should never expect something from someone that we have not expressed to them. It's an unreasonable and unspoken expectation. We get bitter from that. And it's, uh, it's a bitterness of our own making. The third illegitimate way that people become bitter is they rebuked you, okay? They came to you and they rebuked you for something they saw in your life, but you responded with a hard heart. You responded with a hard heart. We talked a lot about a hard heart last week um, uh, in, in the message. And you know how this goes, right? You know the scenario. You know, um, somebody might approach you and they might say, hey, you know what? Uh, something I want to I wanna bring to your attention. I see this sin in your life. And this is something that I think it's hurting you and it's hurting people around you. And I, I just, I think it's something that needs to be talked about and something that maybe you need to deal with. And then, you know, the hard heart response is, well, who are you to talk to me? Who are you to point out my sin. Let's talk about your sin. Did you see what happened there? Counselors call that deflecting. Deflecting. When somebody comes to you and they bring up an issue about you, and instead of diving into that and dealing with that, you deflect from yourself and you point to the problems of the other person. Does this sound familiar, anybody? Does this sound familiar, husbands and wives? Does this sound familiar, teenagers and parents? Right? We do this all the time, and it is sin. It's the result of a hard heart. And the problem is it can lead to bitterness. You see, here's the thing. If the person loves you, you have to understand, it took so much courage for them to muster up, to come to you, to tell you what it is that they saw in your life that needed change, right? It just took so much courage for them to confront you. But you became hard-hearted, and you were hurt by what they said instead of translating it through the eyes of love. And, and then you got bitter against them. The fourth illegitimate way that we become bitter is that you're simply jealous of them. You're just simply jealous of someone, right? Uh, this, this, this usually begins when we're a kid. It really usually begins when we're very young at home. You know, you're, you've got other siblings in the family, and you know, oh, she's the cute one, right? And, and you hear that language even being used. Uh, well, you know, they're the funny one. They're the, they're the athletic one. They're the musical one. They're the obedient one. They're the smart one, right? And, and so you hear this, or you even say this, and you see this, and you begin to seethe with jealousy uh, because of what you see in them. Now, this might help you understand why when you have really good news to share, when you're excited about something, and you share it with people that you're related to or people that you're close friends with, why they respond very differently than how you thought they would in terms of your joy and your excitement, 
right? I mean, a great thing happens to you, and they respond, respond differently. You know, you find out that you got into the college that you wanted to get into, and you share it with your friend, and they're kind of like, oh, yeah, th- great, congratulations, right? And it's because they didn't get into the college they wanted to get into, or maybe even that same college, right? I mean, you, you met someone, you're excited, you're going to go out again, and you tell your friend, you tell your sister about it, and they're just like, oh, whoopie doo for you. You know, what do you, I thought you'd be excited for, no, because they're still single, and they're jealous that they don't have any one. Your kids are walking with the Lord, and, and, and you're just so proud of them and what God's doing in their lives. And you know it's not you. You know it's just you know, where they are with the Lord. And so you give a testimony about what's happening, and, and the friends that you share it with just really downplay it. And they're more kind of like, oh, gosh, you're always bragging about your kids. You know Why? Well, because your kids are wayward. And so you're jealous of the fact that other people's kids are walking with the Lord. You feel guilty about that. You get a job. You get a raise. You buy a house. God uses you in some great way. But instead of joy, you share it with others, and you're met with bitterness, right, because of the jealousy. You see, if you're... Here's the, let me kind of summarize all four of those illegitimate uh, methods or ways of bitterness that we get bitter. If you're bitter against someone for any one of those four reasons that I've just given, you need to understand that you are in sin. You are in sin. And it's it's something in your life that needs to be dealt with. You see, you, you don't get to take out the hat that says victim, right? And walk around as the victim and wear it the rest of your life. Folks, you have to understand, every single one of us need to know this. We're not innocent. You're not innocent. I'm not innocent. The fifth way is actually a legitimate way. This is the fifth way that people become bitter, and it's actually legitimate. Number five, you have been sinned against. You have legitimately been sinned against. Uh, you, you, somebody said, somebody did, uh, somebody failed to say, somebody failed to do something, right? And it's, it's, it's not just you, you know, this is not just you seated on your throne, you know, passing out a verdict. No, this is God seated on his righteous throne, and he's handing down the verdict from his throne. And God is saying, no, you were hurt, legit. I mean, it was wrong. It was sin that was done to you. When we are sinned against, folks, we have two choices. And this is really the big idea of this entire message, okay? Uh, So you want to tune in, right? If you were kind of fading away, um, you know, uh, thinking about uh, something else, you want to tune back in, listen closely. When you're sinned against, you have two choices. Bitterness or forgiveness. That's it. There is no third choice. You may choose bitterness or you may choose forgiveness. Who sinned against you? Let's make it personal. Whose name comes to mind right now as you think about this? Whose face appears in your mind's eye? Who betrayed you? Who abandoned you? Who harmed you? Who was it that disappointed you? Who was it Who was it that neglected you or abandoned you or hurt you? You see, when we have been sinned against, we've been victimized. Here's what we tend to do. We tend to justify our bitterness. Now, I said that you are legitimately hurt. It's a legitimate way that you turn towards bitterness, but it is never legitimate to become bitter. Let's make that very clear. You see, and when you justify your bitterness, you might say to someone, well, you know, what they did to me, they made me bitter. And maybe you've said that. What they did to me, man, that's that's why I'm bitter. That's what made me bitter. They made me bitter. Here's the reality, folks. No one can make you bitter. And that may be a revelation for some of you. What do you mean no one can make me bitter? They've hurt me. What do you mean? I know they've hurt you, but they cannot make you bitter. Becoming bitter is a choice that you make, a choice that you make rather than forgiveness. Oh, but you don't know how bad they hurt me. 
I want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge that. You see, that person who hurt you, they are responsible for their sin. And I promise you, we have a God who is righteous and who is just, and he will absolutely judge truthfully and honesty and with integrity. But you are responsible for your bitterness. We're all responsible for our own bitterness. Becoming bitter is responding to sin with sin. Well, let me give you six commands for, for, for bitterness, right? So we know how we become bitter. We understand getting bitter. We've almost probably all experienced bitterness of some kind. I certainly have. I've been hurt very, very deeply in my life, and I've had to struggle through this battle of, of dealing with bitterness but let me give you six commands for bitter believers. And this comes from our passage of Scripture from today. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 29. I'm going to read this all together. So I'm going to invite you all to stand up with me. This is the old way where we would stand together and read the Scripture together. Now, if you're hurting, you know, if you've got bad knees, just stay seated. You're fine. Uh, but for the rest of us, let's get up and, uh, um, and uh, we'll read the Word of God. Ephesians 4, 25 to 29. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone who is in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. That's building up, not tearing down, building up. As fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Six commands for a bitter believer. You ready? Take some notes. Here we go. Number one, watch your gossip. Watch your gossip. Verse 25 says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Speak the truth with his neighbor. Folks, gossip is when we talk about people rather than talking to people. All right? And, and we all need to get this because gossip has long been the curse of the church. The church has long pointed out other people's sins or other sins and, and marginalize people for their sin while all the time talking and gossiping and, 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 and tearing down the character of the person who we marginalize. That's horrible. All right? That's, and I'm so, Woodland's here. Man, I, I've been talking about this since the day I got here. And, and we need to always be vigilant to watch our gossip. Okay? Let me give you some more on this. Um, Here's the thing. If you think somebody has sinned against you, because you're upset enough to go and talk to somebody else about it, here's a thought. Don't go talk to them. I mean, don't talk to somebody else. Talk to the person who sinned against you. The Bible has absolutely nothing good to say about gossip. Absolutely nothing good. And there's no exception clause if you're hurting. Did you know that? There is no exception clause because you're hurting according to God's word, the scriptures. You might say, but I'm an emotional person. Well, the Bible says guard your heart, right? And the heart is the seat of emotions as is talked about in scripture. You may say, but I'm an outward processor. I process things out loud. Hire a counselor, right? Hire a counselor. We, we have to be very, very careful with our gossip, especially in this age of social media, right? I mean, posting your pain on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, right? I mean, whatever it is, you know, when we do that, we have to understand that, that that has the potential to go viral. And here's the thing, you may think that's a good idea because you're hurt and you want revenge. But that is not the way of the follower of Christ. That is not the way godly men and godly women live their life. Today, more than ever, we have to understand our gossip can literally turn deadly. You may say, you know, but who can I talk to then? 
Well, I have a suggestion. Why don't you go to the Lord and talk to him? We call that prayer. As God's people, we need to understand that we always carry with us two buckets, right? Just so you know, the maintenance person didn't leave buckets up here on the platform. These are actually an illustration. We all carry two buckets with us wherever we go as Christian people. One bucket is full of gas. One bucket is full of water. And when someone starts talking to us about somebody else, right, or about somebody that is not present and talking cruel about them or demeaning them, we have two options right away. We can take our bucket of gas, right, and we can go... Oh, I know what you mean. I mean, she is so ridiculous. I can't stand her. Can you believe she wore that to church? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> or we can take our bucket of water, and we can say, stop. Stop right there. Listen, you know, you have your opinions about her, and that's fine. You're welcome to those, and, and I may have my opinions. We're not going to sit here and talk about her, Okay. We, you, you and I both know that's the wrong thing to do. You and I, you and I, and, I and, you know, and I'm not trying to be holier than thou, you know, because I, I do it too, and I want you to catch me when I do it, all right? But let's, let's just turn this negative talk into positive talk, all right? We just threw the water all over the fire, right? And it, and it, and it, and it, it, it douses the flame, and it keeps the burning fire of gossip from spreading, because we all know people's entire lives and reputations have been ruined because of gossip. Because of gossip. You may ask the question, okay, pastor, I hear you, so I'm supposed to talk to the person that hurt me, but what you under, don't understand is that person is unsafe for me to be around. I mean, that person is dangerous. That person assaulted me. That person is not trustworthy. What do you do? And I, and I get that. I, I do get that more than you probably understand, okay? What you need to understand is today we can make a phone call. We could organize a Zoom call. And we could even have a couple other witnesses with us. If we're fearful because somebody has been violent against us, then we have a couple people with us, right, um, in order to, to bring some protection, uh, in order to bring... Um, uh, some um, honest, non-objective uh, view to it. In Matthew chapter 18, I want you all that are taking notes, write down Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 gives us the perfect systematic approach to how you deal with someone who has offended you, someone who has hurt you. So you can look, up, look that up if that will help you. Um, you gotta, if, if you're going to have that conversation with an unsafe person, you've got to find a safe way to do it. I would never say that you need to go face-to-face -face with somebody who has physically hurt you or even someone who has mentally beat you down your entire life, okay? But in order to save you, see, I, I, I'm, guys, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Jesus, okay? Somebody hurts you, I don't like them either. Can I just be honest? Somebody hurts one of you, my brothers and sisters here at Woodlands, those of you watching at home, man, I'm on your side. Somebody physically hurts you, assaults you, I want to take them out, right? I want to get a couple of my security buddies with me and go over and have a little conversation with them. And I don't mean verbally. Now, that's not very godly of me, I know. But that's how I feel, all right? So I would never want to put you in harm's way. But you need to be set free from the bitterness. You need to be set free from the anger and the hurt and the pain because it will eat you alive. What you may not realize is your bitterness is causing all kinds of medical issues in your body. And for some of you, the medical issues that you're dealing with are the direct result of the bitterness and the anger that you're keeping bottled up inside of you. Oh, see, it's bottled up. I should talk about it. No. No. You need to forgive it. You need to find a way to forgive it. All right? Watch your gossip. By the way, watch your prayer gossip. All right? Watch your prayer gossip. Religious ladies, religious gentlemen, you know how that goes. 
would y'all please pray for my husband? He is such a blank. Would y'all please pray for my wife? Oh my gosh, she is a blank. <laughs> Folks, that, that, <laughs> and, well, and I, I know what y'all do. You justify it, right? You're like, now that wasn't gossip. I, I was just asking for prayer for a, for a bad situation for, so that we can have a better marriage. That wasn't prayer. That was a gossip prayer request. You're tricky, right? You see what you did there. Instead of asking someone to pray for your husband, for your wife, and then lining out all the details of what's wrong with them, maybe we should just pray for you, that you stop gossiping. The second command for bitter believers, number two, watch your emotions. Watch your emotions. Verse 26 is, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Now, what he doesn't say is don't get angry. All right, because God is the God of all of our emotions. The question is whether or not our emotions will drive us toward holiness or will our emotions drive us toward unholiness. Um, you, you may think that anger is a bad emotion, but here's the truth, folks. God gets angry. Jesus gets angry. Anger can be a powerful emotion when it is used toward a constructive good. Let me give you a great example of that. Several years ago, a woman founded an organization, an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mother, it's, the acrostic is MAD, M-A-D-D, -D, right? And she had a child who was killed by a drunk driver. And this drunk driver was a repeat offender. And it looked like, perhaps, there was going to be no justice served with this person who had killed her son. And uh, this may sound familiar. And so she got angry. She got angry. Was it okay to get angry? Darn right it was okay to get angry. It absolutely was justified for her to get angry. What do you think was in God's heart? Do you think God was angry about the loss of a child to a drunk driver? Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think is in God's heart when someone dies unjustly, unnecessarily? God's angry about that. Since 1980... MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, have helped cut drunk driving deaths in half since 1980 when this organization was founded. They've saved around 350,000 lives and they have helped more than 850,000 victims of drunk driving. What she did was to take her anger and do something good with it. She founded MAD to do something good out of her suffering and the pain and the anger that she felt. Folks, I want to invite you to turn your anger to good. Turn your anger to good. How can you take your anger and turn it towards something that's good, something that has a positive impact on society rather than adding to the pain of society? In your anger, do not sin. Watch your emotions. A third command for bitter believers, number three, watch your clock. Watch your clock. Verse 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You see, this was an agrarian society where everything happened with the sun, right? When the sun came up, you got up. When the sun went down, you went to bed, all right? I mean, there was no electricity. There was no Wi-Fi. There was no running toilets, Okay, so, I mean, you just kind of went with the sun. Um, so what he's really saying here, when he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, he's saying, don't let things extend or delay. Don't let your pain delay. Don't let your anger delay or extend for a period of time. Now, that doesn't mean you can't take some time to cool down. If you're, you know, in it and you're angry and you're frustrated, right, you know, you may need some time to walk away from it and, and just calm down, all right? For some of you, that's exactly what you need. But you've got to come back to it. That doesn't mean walk away from it and never return to the discussion. That will allow the roots of bitterness to take root, right? Uh, see, it, it's okay to walk away, but if you walk away for days, for months, even years, folks, it's like untreated cancer. It just grows and grows. Now, some of you are so afraid of conflict 
that you've chosen bitterness instead. And what I'm saying to you is, by choosing bitterness, you've chosen death. Death to your soul, death to your spirit, and in some cases, physical death because of the issues that affect your body, as I've already mentioned. So watch your clock when it comes to your anger. Tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. Fourth command for bitter believers, watch your enemy. you got to watch your enemy. Now this is where Christian instruction and non-Christian instruction differ completely, all right? If you're dealing with bitterness and unforgiveness and you go to a secular psychologist or a, or a secular counselor, they will not take into account Satan and demons. This is why I always say when I talk to someone about getting counseling, make sure you go to a Christian counselor and then I take it a step further. I always say, make sure you go to a Bible-believing Christian counselor, okay? And that's very, very important. Because although secular psychology won't deal with Satan and demons, the Bible does. And, and here's the thing about Satan and demons. They hate God. And they hate God's people. Which means if you love God, they hate you. All right? And, and, and so what happens with demons is they love it when God's people shoot at each other. They love that stuff. First of all, it saves them bullets. All right? And secondly, it absolutely publicly assaults the name of Jesus. Right? There's nothing more devastating than that. This is a spiritual war, folks. We are in a spiritual war. And Paul, the author of this letter to Ephesians, uh, uh, and two chapters later in chapter 6, he dives into that spiritual warfare um, on a deeper, more detailed level. And we'll get there here in a few weeks. The fifth command for bitter, bitter believers, watch your hands. Watch your hands. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands hands that he may have something to share with anyone who is in need so let me ask you what do you do with your hands when you're bitter what do you do with your hands when you're bitter do you shove somebody do you grab someone right do you punch somebody do you throw something at someone do you slam a door at somebody do you go out get in your car grind it into gear and peel off right <laughs> I'm looking at the guys right now. Y'all did that, haven't you? I know you have. All right, I, we, we, we've all done that at some time or another. Okay, maybe not all of us, but I think a lot of us have. What, what, do, you, do you grab your computer? Do you grab your phone and you start typing with your hands? Right? Like we talked about earlier, watch your hands. Do something constructive rather than destructive. Sixth command for bitter believers, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now here's a good rule of thumb, folks. Here's a good rule of thumb. If you're talking about somebody, if you're going off, right? And we've all done it. You're going off on somebody or some situation at home in particular or your family is around. There's three questions I want to give you to filter what you're doing, okay? Number one, if I'm going off on somebody and I'm... Ask this question, would I want my young daughter or my young son to hear me talk about someone like this? Would I want them to hear that? Number two, would I want anyone to talk about me the way I'm talking about this person? All right, that's just a golden rule. Number three, if a new Christian, all right, if a new Christian or a, a non-Christian who I have been praying for heard me talking about someone the way that I'm talking about this person, would that draw them closer to Christ or would that push them farther away from Christ? Use those three questions as filters. Earlier in this chapter, Paul simply said, speak the truth in love. You see, when we're bitter, here's what happens, folks, and it's just true, and if you're being honest, you'll, you'll agree with this. When we're bitter, we tend to become revisionist historians when we're bitter we tend to revise history right you know how we do it 
We omit details that make us look bad, that make us in any way responsible. And we tend to emphasize details that make the person who hurt us look bad. So watch your mouth. Well, how are we going to break this uh, cycle of bitterness? Um, for that, we turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says, Dig up the root of bitterness, or it will grow up to cause trouble and defile many. To grow up to, to, to cause trouble and defile many. Folks, bitterness has roots. That's what Hebrews says, right? The roots of bitterness. Anybody, anybody have dandelions in their yard? Now, I hate dandelions. I just hate them. And there's people who say really pleasant things like, oh, but they're so pretty, they're little yellow, they're like little yellow, like nature's little yellow flower. You know, somebody even said to me, did you know that you can take dandelion leaves and roots and you can make a soup out of them? I said, that's gross. That's really gross. I hate dandelions. I love working in my lawn. Ruthie and I love landscaping and working in our lawn. I do not allow dandelions in my lawn. If I see an aberrant dandelion, if I don't have time to go in and dig it, I'm going to pull it up. Here's the problem with dandelions. That's exactly the problem. When you pull up a dandelion, they have very deep roots. And if you just grab it by the, by the stalk and pull it up, it will snap off and leave all the root in the ground. That's just what dandelions do, right? I mean, they're a pain, a pain, a pain. So what you need is you need a digging tool. You, you, you've got to get down around the dandelion and get all the way down. And if you don't get all the way down, you're going to leave a little bit of it, and it's going to grow back. Forgiveness is the shovel that digs up the root of bitterness. Forgiveness is the shovel that gets all the way down so you can get all of the root of bitterness out of there. So what Paul is saying here is don't just work on your hurt. Don't just work on your anger. Don't just work on your temper. You need to get to the root of bitterness. So let me ask you a rhetorical question. You don't need to raise your hand. Have you been hurt? Have you been bitter? Are you hurt? Are you bitter? Maybe you thought you dealt with it, right? And then something happened and it triggered you. And all that pain and all that anger came flooding back. And you're like, man, I thought I dealt with that. Well, you didn't, because you didn't deal with the root of bitterness. Verse 31 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, clamor means fighting or hot tempers or, or shouting or brawling, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Now notice all those words there, okay? Highlight the words bitter, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. Highlight those words. I'm going to take you on a little journey as we bring this home. This is the perfect recipe for how to build a fire. The perfect recipe for how to build a fire. Um, Proverbs 26, 20. I love this verse. It says, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. Have you ever built a fire, campfire? You ever had the privilege of doing that? It's a lot of fun. It really is. You know, I think, I think boys are natural pyromaniacs. I'm not sure, but I mean, all the boys I've been around, you know, they're just drawn to fire, that kind of thing. Um, the, the first thing you need is a spark, and then you need a little flame. Bitterness is the spark. Bitterness is the spark of the fire. You've been sinned against, you've been hurt, and you decide, I will not forgive them. Okay? The spark then leads to wrath. All right, and, and the wrath, now you've got a flame. Now, now you have the beginning of a potential fire. There's an opportunity here with that, right? That's, that's what wrath is. Bitterness is like the spark. Wrath is like the flame. Now you add a little anger through gossip. And what you're doing here is you're literally blowing on that fire, those glowing embers. You're literally, you know, I, 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 oh, they did this. <sighs> You know, well, they hurt me. You know, he's, well, he's, he's so... 
You're blowing on that little flame and it catches fire. Anger is where you officially have a small fire burning. It's not a big fire, but it could be add clamor. And now your fire starts to grow, right? It's hot. Have you ever been around a big fire? I, I love being around a big fire, right, when it's contained. It's, 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 like, it's like it has a life of its own, and that's clamor. That's clamor. Then you add slander. When you add slander, now you have a nice hot fire. You've got coals are burning. Now we need some more wood, don't we, right? My wood alone will not be enough to build the kind of forest fire that I want to build. So I'm going to start talking to other people about this person that I say is responsible for hurting me. Yeah, everything is burning. Everything's burning, but it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's their fault for what they did to me. That's slander. Then along with malice, he says. Now that's where it becomes an uncontained wildfire. It goes in any direction it wants, consuming everything in its path. This is where whole families get burned down. This is where businesses get burned down. This is where communities can be burned down. This is where friendships get burned down. This is where small groups can get burned down. This is where churches can get burned down. Hurt leaves us with two options, my friends. Bitterness or forgiveness. Wood or water. Gas or water. The Holy Spirit of God knows what he's talking about, doesn't he? He does through his word. The Bible, this, 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 this book, the Bible is not an old book, my friends. The Bible is a timeless book. It is a timeless book that speaks to every generation. Hurt people will hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. But forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people, forgive people. Ephesians 4, 30 and 32. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I know immediately in hearing this, some of you are hearing like, forgive? Forgive? Forgive him? Forgive them? Do you know what they did? No, I don't. I don't claim to know how it's affected you. But God does. God knows exactly how you feel. God knows exactly what's in your heart and the pain that you're dealing with. Truth is, you really can't forgive on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive. The Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, He's the one who empowered the life of Jesus. That was the Holy Spirit. Friend, was Jesus ever sinned against? Was Jesus sinned against? Was he? Come on, you got to wake up. Got to respond here. Was Jesus ever sinned against? Yes, he sure was. He sure was. Did Jesus ever sin against anyone? What was that? No. No, he didn't. So that makes Jesus the most innocent victim in the history of the world. Now let me ask you one more question. Did Jesus become bitter? Say it together. Did Jesus become bitter? No, he did not. You know why? Because he chose forgiveness. He chose forgiveness. The only way we can pull bitterness out by the roots is through forgiveness, which we can only do through the power of of the Holy Spirit. It takes a miracle, my friends, for a bitter victim to forgive. And the name of that miracle is the Holy Spirit. That miracle is available to every single one of us every time we need him. He loves you, and he loves the perpetrator. And he loves the joy, and he loves the peace, and he loves the forgiveness that his spirit can bring. So what do you do? Verse 32, be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, not hard-hearted. We have to watch that hard heart. Be tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, Paul says. 
And you maybe still be thinking, forgive him? Pastor, why should I forgive? Why? Because God in Christ forgave you. That's why you should forgive. Yeah, but can't you see how terrible this is? Can't you see? It just continues to go. God in Christ forgives you. Don't ever think that the sin you see being perpetrated is worse than your sin against God. And that is where the Christian separates himself from the non-Christian. Only a Christian person who recognizes that our sin literally nailed the Son of God to the cross can recognize that no matter how bad somebody else's sin is, it's no worse than mine. And God forgave my sin. That means by the power of the Holy Spirit, I need to forgive their sin. And I promise you, it's the best thing you'll ever do for yourself. When dying on the cross, there were several words that Jesus said. And one of his final words was to his heavenly Father. For those who had beaten him, those who had scourged him, those who had punched him out, pulled out his beard, those who had, had put a crown of three-inch long Judean thorns on his head and squished it into his skull, those who drove nails, railroad spikes into his arms and into his feet and put him up on a cross to suffocate and die, he looked up to God and said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. The people who killed him, he asked God to forgive them. And that's what he's asking us to do. He's asking us, church, he's asking us, followers of Christ, to lead the way, to forgive when it's completely unreasonable, when it makes no sense whatsoever. But we forgive because God in Christ forgave us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your great love. We thank you, God, um, for um, your blessing. Um, Father, we pray now, Lord, as we wrap things up today. God, we pray that you will give us a heart to forgive. God, many people have been hurt very, very deeply, both personally and uh, in our community, in our nation. And Father, you are asking us as your children to lead the way to reconciliation. To lead the way to a nation of equality. To lead the way as brothers and sisters, black, white, brown, red, yellow, to walk arm in arm, to not hate each other, but to love one another. For you said a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, that means laying down our life for each other, so you must love one another. So God, I pray that you will help us to talk a lot less and listen a lot more to our brothers and sisters who are hurting and in pain. And I pray, God, that you would help us to lead the way in all walks of life to choose forgiveness over bitterness. Amen.